evening, this is Pastor Duncans coming to you from Shiloh Baptist Church, and I'm very excited, excited, excited. Wherever you are, I need you to go call someone. We have a very serious topic to discuss tonight. We're actually discussing one of the problems that is being uh, exacerbated by our present trend of racial division and rioting and protests and policing. And that is we're talking about mental health and mental illness. There is a difference, but they're one in the same. Remember, we are very serious. This is Mental Health Month, and African Americans need to understand that we are trying to bring some awareness to what's happening during this time of COVID. I always tell folks, you break an arm, you go to the doctor. Uh, you break a leg, you go to the doctor. You have a cold, you find some medicine. But when your brain, when your mental focus is off, we just ignore it and it gets worse and worse. And plus there is a stigma to all of this. So tonight we have a very important guest, a, a practicing practitioner for many years. She's gonna introduce herself. I wouldn't do her justice. I don't wanna, I don't wanna leave anything out. We have a panel of our women from the church, some of our, some of our uh, also professional women that are gonna help guide this. Sister Nikki Lively, wave your hand at everyone. Please, you can go to the chat. We want you to start asking questions. If you have someone who is addicted, that's mental health. You have someone right now who's being abused, that's mental health. You have someone with trouble focusing, someone who's worming around and don't have a direction for their life. And also, let's be very serious. One in four persons has wrestled with some sort of mental health problem. I know I can tell you, I'm being very transparent, that all of us have to maintain our own mental and emotional health. So let's meet our panelists, then we'll meet our guests last, and I know you're gonna be excited about that. So I'm gonna say your name and I want you to unmute and just tell our folk who you are. And before I do that, please get on the horn. You got a family member that needs to be here. You got a relative that needs to be here. You got a friend that needs to be here. You have some church members that need to be here to make sure that we understand the seriousness and tear down that wall or stigma that comes with understanding mental health. I'll start with our person who's gonna actually be taking care of our questions. Sister Nikki Lively, will you introduce yourself? I am Minister Nikki Lively. Um, this is a very serious uh, event tonight. I'm so glad that we are having the chance to be able to do this. Please ask any questions you need. The more information and the more knowledge we have, the better it'll be. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, we have our assistant pastor's wife, Sister Cynthia Brown, will you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Cynthia Brown, Minister Cynthia Brown, Pastor Brown's wife. Um, I'm the vice president of the women's ministry and I also work with the prayer ministry. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I have a very up and coming, promising leader in our church. I'm very excited about her. Sister Amisha White, will you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Amisha. I am one of the youth leaders here at Shadow. I run our Youth and Young Adult Conference. Amen. Again, uh, we also have one of our, you couldn't tell it by looking at her, she's a dancer, but she's also a professional worker in working with our children, our families of the state. Sister China, can you introduce yourself, please? You're mute. Sorry. I'm Deacon X. China Jones. I'm the president of the Creative Arts Ministry, and um, as well as a member of all, uh, other ministries. Okay, okay. Sister China. We also have. Go out the door. We also have another person. We had a little problem back here. You guys, we're, we're doing this live, so stay with us. I need um, Sister Judy Wadi Jones, who is also one of our workers, hard worker in the church. Judy should be here, because she's probably got some mental problems dealing with me. <laughs> Go ahead, Judy. Hi, I'm Sister Judy Wadi Jones, president of the Kingdom Kids Nursery, and also secretary to the women's ministry. Amen. And then we have our minister, 
Uh, one of our ministers who's also a practitioner in the mental health field, Sister LaDonia Watson. Can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Minister LaDonna Watson, um, and I am the Vice President of the Discipleship Classes and Your Salvation for Shalom Baptist Church. Amen. And like I said before, in my book, Mental Health. Amen. And of course, we also have uh, someone uh, who is, I'm very familiar with, uh, the love of my life. And if she has any mental, mental problems, again, I can equate them to me. I'm going to ask if Sister Duncan to kind of introduce herself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marcia Duncan. I'm the First Lady of Shadow Baptist Church. One church, two locations. What an undertaking. And we have been pastoring here 33 years. Nobody asked you all that. Almost. <laughs> And um, I'm a former retired educator. I taught special ed classes K to three and a former guidance counselor grades K through eight. And currently I am a tutor, private tutor. Thank you very much. And now to the guest of the evening. Here's what I'm excited about. Um, I said offline before we came on, we have Someone here who I know is a believer first. She is a born again Christian. She is an excellent practitioner. If you look her name up and look at the stars that go along with her actual practice, she is a very practical, down to earth, and she is, uh, I'm, I'm excited tonight because she she's gonna unveil to us, if you've never seen it tonight, her book that she's written from her long experiences of practicing. Dr. Clack, I don't want to read, I know how it gets when I someone just reads my resume. So can you kind of, we're gonna ask some questions anyway that will kind of lead us into you talking about yourself. And right now, before I ask this first question, which will give her some background of who she is, I'm gonna ask right now that Sister Nikki, anybody chatting yet? Anybody chatting yet? We've got a couple of members on here saying hello and good evening. So All right, so tell them ready. when they get questions, just let us know and tell them, I say, continue to share and host, host a party. Let's get some real help tonight for this event. So, Dr. Angela Clack, you and I have, you know, we've been associated now probably the last six or seven years. I've sent several people to your practice because of your integrity and because of the fact that I've seen your heart and what you really feel about this and because this is an area that black folk usually don't acknowledge. So what I like, first of all, tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, how you got this practice, and about your practice, please. Sure, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, you have already been introduced to me. I'm Dr. Eva LaClack. Right now, I'm practicing here in southern New Jersey in Sicklerville. Um, I've been in the mental health field, I just say more than 25 years, because I just stopped counting. Um, but I, when, when I go back and I, one of the questions was kind of like some of my work experiences, and I, I had to look back at my vita because it's been so many years, and you know, my first experiences, my, half of my career has been with kids. So I would say probably over the 25 years, 12, the first 12, who were young kids, adolescents. That adolescence has always been my passion, but I used to work with really, really young kids. And as I got older and I stopped getting on the floor, the age of my kids I started seeing got older. So now I see 16 and up into adulthood, but I love working with kids. I've always worked with youth in out of home placement. So it started out with residential care, youth and group homes. And, um, you know, for me, the, one of the most rewarding experiences that I had was the eight years I spent working in juvenile corrections. I, I loved that job so much. And those were boys anywhere from the age, mostly boys, um, but there were girls who also were in confined. We didn't really call it incarcerated, but they were confined. And it started at age 13 all the way up to 25. And I was a mental health director, and I enjoyed that job so much. Those boys, even though they were a rather captive audience, they uh -huh. forced into mental health. When they got through treatment, they ate it up. I mean, they were, these kids really know what it's like to be on the streets, but they also knew what it's like to have poor mental health. And they, they really did take value into, in the work that we were doing with them. That's probably been the most rewarding experience I've had until now with my own private practice and the work that I'm doing. So 
us a little bit about my, my history. Um, tell us about your education and uh, what, what sent you on this journey of mental health. Wow, okay, so I have a doctorate in psychology, clinical psychology from Argus University, which is also DC. Um, my bachelor, so I grew up in West Virginia. You can hear a little bit of my accent. I've been a city girl for a while, but country girl at heart. So I grew up in West Virginia, born and raised in West Virginia, and did my undergrad at West Virginia University. And then uh, I decided to pursue my master's and so that brought me to Baltimore, Maryland. That's where I started my mental health career. So I was there for about 10 years, loved Baltimore as well. I worked before I decided to get my doctor because I really wasn't sure if this is what I wanted to do. And I also wanted to make money and pay off my school loans. So <laughs> I needed to work. So I decided, let me work and see if this is what I really want to do. And then as I got more into the field, I had a really good mentor and she said, you know, you have great clinical skills, but you got to go back. There's more for you to learn. And just based on that, I went back and I did another five years. So I've been in school a long time to get where I am. And so a lot of people, I know you guys have heard people say this, like, you know, you look at people's credentials or you look at what they have and you think you're envious of that, but you got to understand the journey we on to get there. It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. There were many days where I could have walked off of that campus and said, I'm good. Now I'll go back with my matches. I'm good. So it, it has been a bit of a hype. So um, that's clinically kind of where I am. In terms okay, of and my last question where you are is can you tell us also um, about your Christian journey? How you, how you became a believer? So let's see, I didn't get, see, I got baptized because I grew up, always been in the church. My mother always had us in the church. Um, and my mother's church was a Methodist church. And back then, and I don't know if they are now, but they were more very kind of quiet churches and um, maybe like an hour. And so, you know, that was good for kids to sit that long. But I always loved my grandmother's church. She had a Baptist church. And it was around the corner. That's what I'm talking I about. I wanted to sneak around to her church because I could hear the music. And all my friends would talk about it. It was hanging out. I was like, that's, that's where I need to be at. You know? um, but nonetheless, I stayed until I grew up. And then I found my own path. So I always knew I needed to be connected to church. Every college I went to, I found a church. Wherever I was, I found a church. And I've always kind of made sure that my faith was important. Um, even before I understood the importance of a relationship with Christ, I knew I needed a church home. Okay. And so I have been a believer all my life. And I didn't get baptized until I was probably in my 20s and have been on the path of um, developing a stronger relationship with Christ ever since. So thank you for that. Now what we're here for, I'm going to turn this over to our panel. And I'm going to ask our panelists to kind of ask questions. And then we're going to let you give us some information because I know there's information uh, when we get down to you explaining, you know, the long process to your book, but also some of the problems that are happening in the black community right now that you've seen over the years that lead to us not getting help when it comes to mental problems. So uh, if uh, one of our panelists want to start, just raise your hand and we'll, you'll ask your first question. Raise your hand so we can see you. All right, Sister Judy. My question is, um, why do you think most black people or African Americans don't acknowledge mental health? I mean, I think we've all been taught to kind of say, oh, well, that's just our crazy uncle or that's just our crazy aunt, but we've never really addressed mental illness in the African, uh, African American community. Great question. And what we're referencing is the stigma that has been attached to mental health and people of color since we've been born black. There are so many narratives and stereotypes and mis myths and misconceptions about mental illness because when you hear the word mental, the first thing people associate is crazy. Mm -hmm. Let's first agree that that CR word we will not use mm -hmm. on day four because it has so many negative connotations. It is one of the barriers to why people won't speak up and they suffer in silence. And so when you talk about why won't we do this? So growing up, some of the messages I know we've heard this before, and some of us still have these messages in our, in our home. Um, 
whatever goes on in this home stays in this home. You don't take my business outside of here. Don't dare, don't um, air our dirty laundry. And, and worst of all, what I find in my practice that gets um, discovered, unveiled over the years are family secrets. Wow. And so a lot of people for the first time are learning things about family members. And that's exactly right what you said, like that uncle that's in the closet, so to speak, uh -huh. or the aunt who had a breakdown, because we didn't have the language back then to say that was a mental health or mental illness. So we say she was put away, or they sent her down south, all right? And family down south that somebody got sent away to. But it is around the messages that we um, continue to transmit generationally around um, mental illness and it being a white person's disease. We know that's not true anymore. Mental health is real. And we see it more and more in people who are more on public display, like celebrities, like we recently see the whole breakdown with Kanye West. But it happens every day in our families and it's been happening for a while. And the more we have conversations like this, and the more we talk about it, that will help that barrier and eliminate that stigma. Okay, next panel, Sister Misha. You speak a little bit about how sometimes speaking a minority, how that plays on your mental health. I feel like a lot of people may experience things that you know people who aren't minorities might not experience, and don't realize that that impact can have on mental health. So, for instance light skin versus dark skin, how does that affect your mental health? Or being followed around the store, getting pulled over by police. People don't sometimes associate having, having anxiety or something like that because of your race. Wow, so that's a big, big, big question. Because we could start with um, inequity, right? That people of color and persons who have, don't have the same resources that people who have more privilege do, um, there are barriers to access to even in getting mental health. So we can't even get in the door sometimes because we don't have the same resources as other people do when we look at people of color. So um, Pastor Duncan was talking about this is Mental Health Awareness Month. So we have two months. May is a general kind of Mental Health Awareness Month, right? So we do that. July, so I'm so glad you guys are having this conversation now. July is actually minority National Minority Mental Health Month. And they recently, this time for 2020, changed the name to BDIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color Awareness Month. Same thing. But they took away the word minority because of, again, the pejorative nature of being a minority being perceived as less than. And that this month really was set aside since 2008 to look at the, the um, inequity and the lack of access and poor care to Black people in mental health. So the question is right on time in terms of this is the month that we look at those kind of inequities. And when you talk about um, color, you were referencing colorism. And you said why why different people are treated different ways within families. So that's another thing that often families don't talk about. So these are things families don't talk about. But they do come up in therapy. That if there are different shades in the family, different complexion, different hues, that there are sometimes some family members who get treated more favorably than others. But that doesn't happen in black people, that happens in other minorities too. That colorism is a real thing because it's based on the contract of color you see that. And that you're more favored if you're lighter than you are if you're darker. So it can happen in Hispanic families, it can happen in other families too. But when you're talking about the difference in terms of how we're treated, that's that concept of colorism. So then I guess what we're saying is uh, light-skinned people like me have had problems all their life. That's a joke, guys. I'm not chocolate covered here. So that, but that is a real, real uh, problem when we talk about little, little, you know, little nuances that cause people. I think Amisha's question talked about the anxiety. And we're, we're going to get specifically into like panic attacks, anxiety, depression, and some prevalent diseases that affect us. But I thought that was a great question because a lot of times we already have self-esteem issues and then they have to deal with them that way. So thank you. Someone else have another question? You're muted. Okay, my question is dealing with the clientele that I deal with, 
how do you handle them when they come in and you're trying to build social support for them and they're telling you there isn't any water, they don't have anyone they can actually network with? So how do you address those issues with your cartel? So I'm, so I'm going to make it a, a more general because I'm not sure if I remember. I think you said your client was developmentally disabled, am I correct? No, no, I actually work with mental illness, with the schizophrenia, your bipolar. Oh, okay. I work with mental illness. Okay. So in terms of getting people to engage, so we're talking about what happens when people do not want um, a label or people, again, do not want to be identified as having a mental illness. And so the first thing is to help, help people with language. We really have to, there's a difference between mental health and mental illness. So we often use these interchangeably, they are not the same thing. Right. Everybody needs mental health, right? We all, just like you have physical health, everybody has mental health. So mental health is just the way that we think about things, our emotions, our feelings, how we engage socially with other people, whether we don't, but that's just general mental health. Mental illness, is the word illness, right? So there are pervasive deficits in one or more areas, thinking, feeling, behaving, whether I have a thought disorder, that's what you're referencing in terms of schizophrenia. So there is a difference. So people use those interchangeably. But so, because people can have poor mental health, lots of people are not coping well with the sheltering in. And so they're not coping well. That's poor mental health. But that doesn't mean they have a mental illness. Mental illness is a more pervasive presentation of someone who is impaired and impairment and across various areas. So it's in their relationships, they may not be doing well in their job, they're doing their marriage. I mean, it's a number of things. And then again, there's a continuum for people who struggle more with um, deeper level mental illnesses. There's always been a struggle to get people to engage, even when people who generally have been talking about coming to the office. I have people who will say to me, um, I've called a couple of times and hung up, or I, I called and I wanted to come here a year ago. There is a real fear and anxiety about being judged. And so there's a fear that if I go seek mental health services, am I weak? Um, am I gonna be perceived as not being able to handle things? People will think that, um, I'm, again, I don't like to use the word, but the people use it, I'm crazy. So it really begins with developing a relationship to get people to engage. There's, there, it's, it, it's making people feel comfortable around even what a therapist looks like. Not all of us look like what you see on um, <laughs> Psychology Today profiles. I'm just going to put it out there. Y'all can just get me there. But, um, <laughs> on profiles, poor people don't look like us. Some of us are very intelligent, are very well in terms of, do very well in terms of clinical, and we may wear jeans and a tee, have tats and, and draw. I mean, we just don't, we don't all look the same. It doesn't say anything about our level of expertise or work. But there are folks like us who want to see people who look like us. Now, not everybody. There are people, uh, black people, who choose to choose um, not to see black therapists. But largely, we're finding that people want to see someone they can relate to. And so that's the start. If they feel like, well, if I can sit with someone that I don't have to explain everything I'm talking about, um, or go into detail, and they'll forget what I'm talking about, that's one comfort level. So it's really about how you develop a relationship before they even get into your office. And that's where I think it's more fun, or whatever your initial contact is. Okay. Okay, can I ask a question? Okay, are there any tips you can give uh, give us when we know a family member is in trouble dealing with anxiety, depression? Like, is there some type of, even a site that we can go to, like how to open that door or engage that relative to seek help? Of what, you know, uh, like you said, language, to get them to be comfortable enough not to deal with those inner demons by themselves and resort to other ways to deal with those issues, you know, unhealthy ways to deal, to deal with those issues. Is there even a support group maybe for family members to help a, a loved one get help? Like that's, that's, that's a hard thing to do. It's very hard. So there are organizations out there that provide a lot of family support. So like NAMI, which is the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, that's one group that is a national organization. 
do a lot of groups, they do a lot of family support, they do a lot of community-based work. So they'll set up groups in the community, like it could be in a church or it could be in a, um, maybe it could be an outpatient clinic or something, but it's where families can come together and to be able to support one another. Ultimately, if a person doesn't want it, they're not gonna do it. As much as we wanna love them into getting help, if they resist, they're just gonna resist. Um, there are plenty of things that we can do. One of the things I would offer is, can I help you find someone? If I have someone. So for example, I have family members, young people, and I want them to see someone, and I'll say, what if I find a person for you? I'm like, mm -hmm. I get real desperate. What if I find a person for, mm -hmm. for you? And they can say yes, and still not really, they can say yes, and I can go through all the trouble finding someone, and they're like, nah. Ultimately, they have to be ready. They have to be ready. They have to see that what they're struggling with is enough pain. It has to get bad enough. Um, and sometimes we see it get bad, and for them, it's still not bad enough. Uh -huh. and, and the best we can do is provide support, point them in the right direction, give them names of therapists. You could also give them books. There are lots, tons of books out there that people are writing about mental health. There's more movies out there that are more appropriately, accurately depicting mental health. That, that's, the, that's the best we can do is just provide support and encouragement because you really can't make somebody do something that they just aren't ready to do. And, and it's really about fear. So mm -hmm. how can we help them get past the fear that, um, in language. So you know we have to be careful about how we, how we share our observations. So mm -hmm. some people are like, oh, you need to go get help because something's wrong, you know. Right that doesn't offend or insult their intelligence. That they could see like, okay, I see what you're saying, I have been drinking more. Or, yeah, I see what you're saying, I'm arguing a lot, I've, been, I've lost a couple jobs, maybe there's something I can do. So maybe they start with a support group, maybe it's more like a mentor, until you can work them up into the actual therapy room. The only thing really now that works to our advantage, because of COVID, almost 99% of therapists are doing telemedicine. So they don't even have to leave their home, they can be on their phone, they can sit in their car, they can be on the corner, wherever they, wherever they can, they don't have to actually worry about someone seeing them come into an office. So that's the one thing that's working for us at this point. Okay. Can, you, can you talk a little bit more, you hit on it, uh, you and I talked earlier about cultural competence. Now, I don't want you to diss anybody in your field, you know, but we understand that this does this transcends mental health. I mean, this is something that has to do with physical health and, and any other a lot of other fields. Talk a little bit about cultural competence. So the question one of the questions said, is cultural competence enough? So the question would be no. Go ahead. The answer is then what do we do in terms of helping people? who don't look like us, so to speak, I'll, I'll go there, who don't have the experiences of working with black people or people of color, or Hispanic people, or Asian, whatever group we're talking about in terms of cultural competence. When I was in graduate school, we only needed one course, a three, a three credit course on cultural competence, that's it. And I don't think that's changed, because I've talked to, I wanted to know, I've been asking graduate students how much more they get. They don't get much more than that. Because your real learning is really when you go on your, your residencies, your um, practicum, that's when you really get into the work, and you'll realize that you don't have enough of cultural competence. So cultural competence is real, but it's not enough. You almost have to be immersed into a culture to really get the nuances of it to understand it so that the person doesn't feel like they have to explain every narrative that they come in to talk to you about. So think about this. I, you know, because I do work with um, more black women than, than other cultures, I have a fair number of young black women too, under 20. And the reason why I love working with black women, I have a passion for, for mental health black women, is you can be so connected and so real with them. But at the same time, when you get in the room and start doing the therapy work with them, 
they have to get real too. And sometimes, because you look like them, it starts to get scary. So it's pretty cool when she's crying and she goes, hold on, let me take my lashes off. Because I don't want to mess these good, expensive lashes up. She wouldn't do that in another office with somebody who doesn't look like her. Because they wouldn't get it like, oh yeah, I know. Put, put them over there, here's a napkin, because I don't want you to mess. Put them on when you leave. Like, I get that. I, I get that. And not everybody's going to get that. Not everybody's going to get by their family secrets and black families. So not everybody is going to understand what it's like to be a black woman who has to wear a superwoman cape and you keep telling her, oh, you need to take a rest. Just take a day off. Wow, you really are strong. You're doing a lot. A black women understand that that's a burden. And so to say that, that, that we're strong dismisses who you see as, 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 as you don't hear that, you're not hearing me. I don't want you to tell me that I'm strong. I want you to understand that that's what other people are telling me. And that I'm in pain right now, but you're not getting it. Because all you see is what you see on the outside. And so I hope I answered your question around cultural competence. It requires more than a course. It definitely requires more than a course. And when I wrote my book, my last chapter specifically was for newly, newly seasoned, even um, clinicians of color who are still learning how to work with people of color, but also white therapists. And to help them understand, like, you have to join with that black woman. Because my book is about women. You have to figure out how to join with her. This is about the relationship. You can work with her, but if you do anything to dismiss or hurt or humiliate her in that first session, she's not coming back. Not only is she coming back, you might have her chances for her to seek therapy anywhere else because that now is experienced as a failure. So we have to be very careful about how, and that, that's why a lot of times you'll hear people say they don't want to go to see a white therapist because they've heard bad things. And that doesn't mean all white therapists are bad. Some are trained very well, and some can get you to a certain level because they have a great skill set in a particular modality. But if you want to talk about racial trauma, they may not be ready for that, or they may not have the knowledge or the expertise to do that. And so what I've done with people is split. So sometimes people come to me, they have a white therapist or something, they come to me for something else. And that's fine, because we're working on two different things. We're working on two different things. Okay, great. Someone else? Go ahead, Nick. I have a question. Um, being as though that you said that you started out working with the youth in mental health, how would you advise us as a church um, to be able to help children that are coming up um, in the church to feel safe without being judged um, for having an aspect of mental illness or mental health? That's a great question. I am so concerned about the number of suicides that are happening with kids as young as five. Wow. So the rate of children five to 12 for our black youth is now more than white youth. And I believe 18 to 24 is the second leading cause of death by suicide for our blacks as well. I am very concerned that young children do not have the language to always say what's happening at home particularly if there's sexual trauma. So that is probably the largest issue when I think about younger children. Besides witnessing domestic violence, sexual trauma is huge. And if you're not trained, you'll miss cues and signs because you're just not trained. It's not your responsibility to pick up all those things. Because even sometimes a mom is missing those things when the perpetrator is a stepdad or boyfriend or, or uncle or grandfather. So unless you're trained to know, um, and these are the conversations I love that, that, that this platform that Pastor Duncan and his team has put, ministry team has put together because it does open that door for that conversation that children do spend a lot of time in church, right? Church and school um, have historically been where we've gotten our, our kids to come to, whether it's because of it's an event or they love their youth group or it's a youth camp. And that's where they link actually talk to a camp counselor or youth minister where they would not necessarily tell a parent or they might not tell a teacher or they might not tell a therapist. But you might have developed a relationship with them over time to be able to get them to start to confide. And of course you need to know the laws that you have to report and how to report and all that good stuff. But that is, I think that's the crux of what you're asking me is like, 
how do we start to pay attention to behaviors? What, what, what do we see that may be different in a kid? And are we overreacting? I, for me, I'm gonna be, I, I would say, I don't think you're ever overreacting. I, I would pre prefer you to overreact and under. So even if it's just to say, hey, I noticed that such and such wasn't here for a couple of weeks when it came back, he looked sad or something. And just to check in with kids a little bit more, our youth are under so much attack, spiritually and also emotionally. And particularly, again, I cannot stress enough how much sexual abuse is rampant and has always been. These aren't new narratives, sexual trauma back generations. Um, we just didn't talk about it. And now the church can be a big payment for these kids. So it is really about kind of knowing the signs, knowing shifts in emotions. Kids who weren't aggressive, now they're more aggressive. Kids who weren't withdrawn, they are more withdrawn. And how to kind of draw that conversation out of them in a safe way. Church should be a safe place. Mm -hmm. So that would be naturally an organic, a place for, an organic place for kids to come and talk about something. Okay, um, can we also at this point, uh, I thought that was a great series of questions, and especially you, you mentioned, I think it was NAMI, can you say that acronym again? I want to put it in the chat so everyone can find, because I want someone to leave out of here with some help. So you want okay. to explain that again? Uh, uh, Tim, Tamika, can you put that in the chat? Nick? Put that in so people can see a place to get help. And we're going to talk a little bit more in that direction. So where was it again? So, so it's NAMI or NAMI, or either way, N-A-M-I, and it's the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. So it's national, and then there are smaller groups in the community. They have community groups. And they do a large amount of work with families and loved ones who have a person with a mental illness. Now there are lots of resources out there. There's resources out there for men. Therapyforblackmen.org and therapyforblackgirls.org. Those are directories, they have blogs, they also have um, resources as well for connecting. So there's more, and what I'll do is, um, Pastor Douglas, I'll send it to your team, I'll write it up, and make sure you can, if you want to put it in your resource directory, I'll make sure you have it. Okay, you'll get a contact from our women's ministry. While you're there, uh, ladies, I hope you don't mind, but this is something that's personal as a pastor over these years, I was shocked. And it, it took my wife to inform me the number of women who have been sexually abused. I talked, I, I didn't know it was so prevalent until I started pastoring and people confided in me that I could be looking at six women and five of them could have been abused. It was just that prevalent in society. And I found out that it was penetrating deeply into their spiritual walk what they were trying to do now. So I think this will be a good segue for you to talk about your book. Kind of kind of tell us, you know, because I think looking at the narratives, I believe, I know at least two of our folk on the platform have read it, um, and we'll talk about it after that. But tell us about, I want to stay with the women's area, because I find women who are dealing with that area of abuse, I find dealing with singleness because of the just sheer numbers in our society and looking for someone and that loneliness and singleness kind of doubles up with other areas and it really adds into a, a plethora of mental problems. So tell us about your book right now, please. So, sorry, there is a fly who just won't move off my camera. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so my book, um, so maybe this is a good, a good place to also kind of talk about the journey and in terms of writing the book, I'll kind of lead up to that. So the book was written and finished in 2018, but I had started the book two years before. So the journey from start to completion was a little more than two years, and here's why. I originally wrote the book because my practice started growing, and this is when I first started seeing this boom and more and more black women being so courageous and stepping into the office and making the call that I need help. And there were so many of them, and at that time I was the, uh, just the only one in my practice. I could not see everyone. And I'm a person who has a hard time saying no, and I have a heart for women and a heart for women with broken hearts and, and brokenness and trauma, so I, I wouldn't say no. And over time, I was getting burned out. 
I kept it, and, and then I met with a coach because I needed to figure out how to um, re-strategize, re-strategize my practice because we had to figure something out, and I had to do something with my business. And she suggested, she said, there are going to be some women who never step into your office because of the stigma, or they just won't. But she says, you can't see everybody. Have you thought about all of this information you're teaching women? Why don't you put it in one place so they can have access to it? And that was the birth of the idea of the book. I had never, ever considered myself an author, never thought I would be. That was not what you were taught in graduate school. You just kind of taught to have this blank slate and you work with people and you don't expand your repertoire skills. And so I started working on the book, but I went back to working again. And so the time that I put aside for writing, I was seeing people. It delayed the book again. Uh, about a year and a half into it, it, you know, I realized something had to get. So I hired a book coach. I hired a book coach to help me be accountable to writing. And with her help, I got the book done in six months. And so there's something to, again, resources out there for all of us. We are not exempt as helpers or healers um, from needing support. And I needed that, and I got the book done. And that was in 2018. And the book is about psychological narratives on trauma and depression. And it was because so many women were showing up in my office with histories of trauma. And there were women 40, 50, and 60 who for the very first time had been able to disclose about a sexual trauma that had been happening in their family for generations. They may have been four or five, all the way up to 19 or 20. And they had never told anyone. And so in one, in, one, in one way, I feel so privileged to be a witness to that journey for them. On the other hand, I felt very sad. And because I'm thinking, wow, you lived 50 years struggling because you didn't have a place to talk uh, or felt safe enough to share. And so the book, I pray, will be that conversation that women's ministries can have, book clubs can have, other therapists can give it to their client to say, hey, I think this is a great resource. Why don't you read it? I've had family members buy it for other family members because they can't get them into therapy. But there's enough richness in their own clinical work, but also I share narratives. Of course, protecting identity and I changed identities and everything. But the narratives are real. And that was the start of the book because almost every woman, I can count maybe two women in the last 10 years, maybe two, and, and this, this I, if I wish I would have kept them that did not have a sexual abuse history. Wow. Almost every one had a sexual um, Whether it was a rape, or which happened maybe in college, so they didn't have a childhood trauma, but many of them had childhood traumas. Um, and sometimes it was multiple trauma, multiple victims of sexual trauma. Wow. Any questions, ladies, you might want to follow up that question. Go ahead, make then send me. I have a, a question actually through the chat. Um, someone wants to know, how do you deal with an elderly person that seems depressed and may be in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's um, with the geriatric population or early dementia with mental health? Okay, so let me put a quick disclaimer out there because I don't have to, that this doesn't replace any information that people are already getting from physicians or if you already have a therapist, I have done this before, and people will go back to the therapist and say, she said, so listen, this is the supplement. Take it back and say, I heard a talk, and she brought this up. So I have to put that disclaimer out there. Um, when it comes to geriatric and aging population, if someone's looking at something like a progressive illness like dementia or Alzheimer's, I think if they haven't already started medically, so the first thing is definitely you need to see a neuropsychologist um, or um, someone who can look at the brain in that way. So the first thing is um, getting them to see a doctor. Now we know that older persons, aging persons, can be just as contrary as little kids. I'm just going to put that out there and they don't want to go, they ain't going either. But if you look at it, maybe you have to present in a medical way versus a mental health or psychiatric way. Because it is, Alzheimer's and dementia, they do impact medical and mental health. But they might not be so open to seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but they will go see their primary. Which leads me to one more thing about that. 
um, often people don't know where to go for help when they first when they have their first mental health break. They just don't know where to turn to. And so the first thing they do is go see their doctor and they'll see a primary because they just don't know where to go. I just caution everyone who's listening, everyone here, when you see a primary care physician that mental health and psychiatry is not, unless they took a specialization in that, most of them don't, most of them are medical physicians. Mental health is not their lane. So if you go in there and you say, I have, I'm sad, I feel like this, I feel like that, you're gonna walk out with a prescription. And you may not need medication. Now you may, so I'm not one who does not, I believe the medication. But I caution you about seeing a primary versus seeing a mental health professional first, or in conjunction. Um, I do love people to get a full physical exam before they come to, or, or at least during the process of therapy, because there are also medical issues that mimic mental health symptoms. So we want to just take care of the whole person. So when it comes to the elderly, I would definitely start with a medical workup first when it comes to um, dementia and Alzheimer's, because that is a progressive illness, and that, that requires a lot, a lot of caregiving. And so really the stress also there is on the caregiver. And so I encourage them to seek out support because that's a lot for um, people to manage, especially if they have kids, they have their own family and they're trying to work. That's a lot of doctor's appointments and taking off work. And um, you know, as that illness progresses, they can, they can get very progressive, so. All right, someone else have a question at this point? You're, you're muted, Cindy. Oh, yeah. um, Dr. Clark, my question is about the family secrets. Like Pastor was talking about, um, a lot of women been abused, um, maybe a family member, maybe they they break. How do you help those family members to get help without hurting other family members if the family member was, you know, close to? Wow, that's a big one. Um, that's a it, so, and sometimes it makes a difference if the person who is the holder of the secrets or the person who is the one who harmed the family is living or not. Right. When you find out that a family member has abused someone, and they finally tell you at the years without hurting other people that's involved, how do you handle that situation? Uh, with a lot of sensitivity. That requires, I, I, I would encourage the person who's in that situation to work with a therapist around how to even disclose that, um, when and where, because maybe the disclosure needs to happen in family therapy, where they're all in one room together. Um, it's gonna bring up a lot of pain from generations, um, because it may not be the person may not even be around anymore. So that person may get blamed to say that's not true. You don't want to get in the, you don't want to get in this quandary of having to defend your story. If you said you were abused and, and that's your truth, you want people to believe. You don't want this going back and forth and family members ostracizing you, um, calling you a lie or dismissing your narrative or your story. It, so that's a very delicate uh, um, situation. And, and sometimes, and, or do we, do anything with it at all. That That is definitely the work and to help that person find the safest way um, to have that conversation. Very delicate situation. You just lost it. I work with both men and women coming out of prison. Um, I had people, I had somebody who, who did 58 years in prison and then came out to me, went in as a 16 year old, came in, he was almost 70 by the time he came out. So, to speak about the importance of one, us recognizing that incarceration can be a very traumatic experience for somebody, 
And yes, they may have gotten themselves there, but coming back in the community, it's not necessarily bling, 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 nothing. It's kind of love um, and understanding and why it's important for people who are coming out to receive mental health services. So for instance, I had a client who was incarcerated for six years. Out of those six years, when we added up all the time, four of those years he spent in the hole, which is um, self-isolation. And so when he came out, it was, you know, you spent quite a good amount of time by yourself in the room for 23 hours a day and not understanding like those voices that he was hearing or those hallucinations that he was seeing, how that was an uh, after effect of him being in isolation for so long. Absolutely. So th when I heard your, your, um, your role in the church in terms of working with uh, incarcerated persons, like you see in my face lit up because that was like my population. I love working with with those group of boys. Um, you know, we now know that isolation and confinement is uh, uh, is very significantly traumatic, and that there are kind of laws and things being put in place to eliminate twenty three hours in lockups and holds. But incarceration in and of itself is traumatic, and that amount of years, any amount of time being away from your family, being subjected to all of the kind of things that happen in there that lots of people don't even know or not even aware of. I would love to see that the therapy happen in there and then continue on the outside. So we were able to do that because we work with youth. So they, that's a priority in, in, at that time, at least for when I was in there, and I think it still is, that was a priority. So when kids needed, kids or young adults needed mental health, they got out it, and they got as much as they needed, but then when they got out, they didn't continue it. And so that's the kind of pipeline that we need is that they start their mental health services, and then they make it a condition of parole or probation that they continue, but the problem is is helping them find people to work with. Because when they're coming out, they're not necessarily employed, they may not have insurance, so how will they find someone who will take them and who could see them um, either at a low or low cost or some kind of pro bono. So there's, again, so we that's what we're talking about, the inequity and, and, and barriers and access to care for everybody. That that's gonna be harder because they're coming out into situations where they now are having to um, re kind of restart their life all over again in many ways. You know, housing, job security, down to clothing and food. Like a lot of case management has to happen. And Lots of families probably struggle with the fact that they were in there, how they got there. So there's a lot of feelings around how they got there and why they're there. But they need the most support when they come out to prevent recidivism, making them at risk to go back. That's when they need the support as soon as they come out. And so we can find a way to make mental health almost uh, automatic for them. I know some have groups that, again, there are community supports out there. They need the connections, though. I, I wanted to um, ask you, and that's a great question, Misha, because that leads to other major problems that go after that. Like a young man came home from prison, great, he had self-esteem, finished his term, moved back in with his girlfriend, couldn't find a job. You can only go in someone's refrigerator for so many months before they get tired of it, no matter how big muscles you got. And so he started abusing the kids mm -hmm. and the woman. I mean, it went into his, his mental health, went into destruction of the family because he could not cope. So I'm, I'm leading somewhere. I want you to talk about, because Cindy asked a very probing question that comes to a pastor a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I, I get to hear the secrets. Talk about owning your healing. Uh, that, that may be my terminology, but I think ultimately at the end of everything, even you as a therapist, somewhere along the line, I got to grab away whatever tools you give me and own my healing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. So I know that we've all seen the meme that the trauma wasn't your, the trauma wasn't yours, it wasn't your responsibility, it's not your fault, but healing is. And so, right, you were and may have been the victim of hurt, harm, rejection, abandonment, all kinds of trauma, travesty in your life and adversity. And you can stay in that place. You can stay deep down in the valley for 
or you can decide that healing is my birthright. So spiritually, you can start to work through that. You can say that healing is the way that I can adapt and cope to live the rest of my life in a way that um, would shift my relationships, would shift who I, am, who I am and how I show up, because my trauma doesn't define who I am. And that's what I work with a lot of people who have been hurt a lot. And one of the words I really have worked on with folks is this word church hurt. There are a lot of women um, that I have worked with, women and boys, who were hurt in a church, whether it was someone who attended the church or someone in ministry and leadership. That is the ultimate betrayal because the authority and the relationship and how much regard we put for people in those positions. And so now, they no longer want a relationship with God, they don't, relate with God. They don't have nothing to do with the church. And we don't want them to be disconnected from their power source in that way. We want them to stay connected and find a great faith place, to, a, a house of faith to, to, to have, one, connection, two, to, to get this away. But if we disconnect from all of that, the trauma will continue to define who they are as a person. Healing will help them to change that narrative. And that's, again, why I wrote the book. Because lots of women still at 30, 40, and 50 are struggling with self-esteem. And it's not self-esteem like I feel good today because I have makeup on and my hair done. Self-esteem is an identity issue. Well, I don't even know who I am because I've lived my life behind a veil for so long. And I'm tired. And the struggle is real. And they're ready to make a change, but the healing is on them. And so that's where I say when you get into therapy and then the work comes beyond us, kind of our little greeting and niceties and we start giving you work to do and it gets harder before it gets easier and you've got to go into the pain to get to the healing, that's where I do some of my work. And so the healing is tough, but on the other side of that is so much greatness. If I, I just get them to hold on and know that they're not alone, that we have a great healing space and therapy or whatever social support they have, if they can get on the other side of that, they're going to be all right. Great, great. Um, anyone have a, a question right now? Any more chat questions at this point? Sister Nikki? All right, I wanted to um, know what to check in our time frame, but I, I want to give you some specifics now. Talk about addiction. Uh, can you kind of tell us what are, what are some of the prevalent illnesses in the black community? And I want you to definitely hit addiction. So one of the things I just wrote about recently is that the root of every addiction, sex, food, shopping, drugs, alcohol, um, food, whatever addiction, the root of every addiction is trauma. You can ask anybody, go back in their history and help them to pinpoint when did this start for you. There is a link to some kind of trauma doesn't matter what addiction it is. That's, the, that's where the work has to be. The addiction is just the vice. The addiction is just my outline. That's what I do to anesthetize the pain of the trauma. That's what I'm doing. So, you know, lots of times people will go into rehab after rehab after rehab because they're not dealing with the trauma. They just go in there for a detox. And then they go in there, and if they don't find a program that deals with that tra trauma, some are quick, some are not. It continues to perpetuate, and it can go from one addiction to another. So that's one thing. What's major in my practice, and a lot that is happening now, and, and, and some of this is as a result of the sheltering in and the COVID is anxiety. Most of us as therapists are seeing a tremendous amount of anxiety disorders. So I have two kinds of populations. So I have people who, since January and February, March, subsequent have developed anxiety disorders, and we know that situation. But then I have another group of people who have pre-existing anxiety and have had it all their life. And people who think that black people don't have anxiety and they don't have depression, 
and they don't try to take their life. And those are all myths. There are many people who struggle with depression. It may not look like a white woman's depression, but it's depression. It may not look like a white woman's anxiety, but it shows up for black women in very different ways. Why? Because we try to hide so much of our stuff. It comes out in other ways. And so we got depression, we have anxiety, we have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is trauma, and then you have the addictions. And addictions can be on a continuum from food, sex, um, even shopping addictions, to drug and alcohol addictions. And I'm probably missing some in between. Um, but those are the main reasons. Now, there are on the other spectrum, the psychotic disorder. So we do have a fair amount of black folks who do hear voices, do see things, and do meet criteria for schizophrenia. And that's one of the more serious mental illnesses that we really want can, to Can I about. stop you there? Because that's one of the areas that sometimes laymen don't understand. Talk about the brain, uh, you know, because sometimes they think that's spooky. But just talk about the reality of, of the brain side of that and the chemicals and the whole physical piece, please. Yeah, so when it comes to the, the well, we'll talk about schizophrenia as an example. So we call that in the mental health in terms of when we're looking at diagnoses, um, a thought disorder. So that means there's something in the brain for that person. So that, that's a brain disorder. It doesn't mean that, um, which has happened. This has historically happened when, um, so we have to look at this both ways. We are spiritual beings. Black people in the black church has been the backbone of the black community for centuries generation. And so we believe in spirits, we believe in ancestors, we believe in that. And so if a black person goes into a white therapist's office and says, oh, you know, my, my great grandmother came and visited me last night and she told me such and such, I believe in spirits, you might walk out of there with a diagnosis of psychosis. If the person doesn't ask you more questions about what is your faith, how do you practice your religion? Right? So that's one thing. So we want to make sure that First of all, people are being accurately assessed when they talk about spirit, spirituality, and their belief system. Now, on the other hand, we as black folk have to also embrace that some of our family members have a true psychiatric psychotic disorder, which means their brain doesn't work the same way. And so there's something that has happened in a part of the brain that creates the hallucinations where they may see things, or these are the people that you see walking down the street. They may be talking to us themselves, or a fair amount of our homeless people have met that criteria. And so that's kind of, so it's, I don't want people to see it as a woo kind of thing. It's real, and it's it's treatable, and it's manageable. Um, that's, the, that's the one thing. All of our mental illnesses are treatable and manageable if we get people to support at the right time. So none of this has to be the spiral into the rabbit hole. It doesn't have to be that way. But are, there, we, as black people, are having more conversations about mental health, um, partnering with churches and pastors like yourself, Pastor Duncan, who believe in mental health. Because there are also a fair amount of people who don't seek mental health because they have been told in their church that the reason why you're not doing well is because you don't have enough faith. You're not praying enough. You're not fasting enough. You're doing something enough. And so that person starts to blame themselves, internalizes that, and their mental health distress continues. So I, this is part of why I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation. Well, my, my members will tell you, and then Misha, your question, I tell you, you need a shout, you need the Holy Ghost, and your medicine before you come to church. Ah. Take your pills. Don't. Don't come and think, and don't get somebody lay hands on you. You throw your pills away. Keep them. Yeah. See if it works after you leave church. Uh, Misha, go ahead. Um, so I live in Delaware, and right now we have a very big push for black mothers um, mental health. So postpartum, what does that look like? How do you deal with it? How do you overcome it? So can you just speak a little bit about what postpartum looks like? and some verses for mothers, um, and understanding that it can happen six months after a child's born, it can happen 18 months after, just understanding that time frame, and how, how we as a black community can uplift those mothers to say, like, yes, it's real, but we also have your back. 
Wow, so that's another great um, area that is being recognized in terms of mental health is um, maternal mental health. And so last week was Black Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week. So there are people, so when you see these commemorative things coming up, that means the level of awareness and recognition is starting to be more and more um, promoted. So that means we're starting to look at things that we didn't look at before. And I think postpartum is one that people didn't know a lot about, that we probably thought it was um, something with the mom having, she just isn't bonding with the baby. And that's where it kind of ended. But postpartum is a mood disorder too. It's depression and it's anxiety. And it starts with difficulty bonding, but it doesn't just happen after she has the baby. Many women are depressed during pregnancy and even before. And so the struggle is, if a woman is very depressed and she's on medication and she does well, and she decides that she wants to start a family, she has a very serious decision to make. Do I come off my medication? Um, because that means I'm probably gonna be depressed during most of my pregnancy until I get to past the critical period. Um, do I find a medication that research says has minimal effects on in utero with the developing baby. And that's a lot of decisions for a woman to make who's struggling with a mental illness. And so we can have perinatal depression, you can have prenatal, you can have post. And she's right, postpartum can go up beyond a year. The thing of it is, is to watch our moms. You know, they don't want to tell people about the thoughts that they're having. So when I see a mom who's having postpartum, She's afraid to tell her family members that she's afraid to be a left alone with her baby. Or um, she has thoughts of hurting her baby. But she is. So where does she go if she's really feeling that way? Because it's real. Those are some of the symptoms of postpartum. Um, I feel like I'm going to hurt my baby I'm gonna, or I'm afraid that I'm not going to be a good mom. So that turns into a struggle for herself. Um, and the biggest support system for, for a mom is if the father is present, is that he is a helper. So many when I see get so down in therapy because once the husband or boyfriend or partner is done with work, he comes in the house and he's XTB. He's out with the boys. She's been home with this baby all day. And she is depressed. She was depressed before, she's depressed now, and she's lonely. So a lot of times in therapy, when it comes to postpartum, we want to bring that partner into that room too. We want to help them understand how much of a role he'll play in helping her to get well, stay well, and also so that the baby is protected. Because we do know there are extremes with postpartum where women have actually her babies. So we want to be very much aware there are postpartum screens that physicians do do with the moms, and they do it periodically. But the mom has to be honest about how she feels, and if she thinks that if I tell this person I want to hurt my baby, and they call Child Protective Services and take my baby, then I'm not going to tell her. I'll, I'll deal with this. And so she, again, suffers in stomp. So we need this kind of conversation. Great question, great question. Um, so, um, I'm going to ask anyone to kind of gather up your last questions, because the big question of the evening is, what do you do if you yourself, I need to mute themselves, if, if you yourself feel like you are dealing with some mental issues? Give us a pass. Give us a, what do I do if I find myself, I'm, I'm going to be honest with myself, I'm not sleeping, I may be hearing voices, I know that I'm, i got anxiety and panic attacks. I, I read, I, you know, I, I pray. Somebody told me it's the devil. I cast the devil out, but I'm still going through this struggle. What do I do? Because of the stigma of mental health, and I know that some people won't readily go from, I know I need it, to making the phone call, there are hotlines out here too. So it may be a start with a hotline, but maybe it's to call and when you find yourself excessively using practice hotlines, then you should probably step into the room and do something more consistent with the therapist. But that might be people's first entree is to use 
um, like a 1 800 um, or the, the text hotlines that we have out there, particularly for youth. We have a number of kind of apps out there. So that's my first thing. If they can't, if they feel like they can't walk into an office right now or they, they're afraid to um, see a therapist, use your hotlines. We have emergency hotlines out there for people. The second thing is, is if you can find someone you can trust to provide it and ask them for resources. There are more and more people who know a therapist, who know somebody who knows somebody who knows a therapist, my friend is seeing a therapist, um, that even if that therapist can't see them, can help them connect. I do so many of these virtual conversations that I will tell people, even though if you're not in New Jersey, because I, one of the things you have to understand legally too, as a therapist, you can only see a therapist in the state which you reside. So if someone sees me on this and they're in Florida, and they'll say, I would love to work with you, I couldn't, because I'm not licensed in the state that you reside. But I know enough people, because I'm on enough listservs with their presence in Florida, to say, but, but inbox me, I'll help you find someone. Like, I will extend my, ser my services that way with, without a blink of the eye, because if you're asking for help, and the only barrier is you don't know where to go, and I can link you, I'll help you find someone. I'll call them around until I find you somewhere. But so that would be the one thing is to find someone you can confide in and say, do you know someone that I can talk to? Um, and they may know someone. That's the place. Again, I'm cautioning you about seeing your primary, but there are good primaries out there who will say, I have a couple business cards of therapists that I partner with or I know of. Start here. So sometimes it's about networking. Maybe you're somewhere and there's a group of people and it's a community event, there's a, a lot of health fairs, you might meet someone through that way. So it's about access to resources, um, but at least once you acknowledge that I know I need it, I think you're more motivated to do the work to find someone. I'm gonna give our panels a chance to do their last uh, question because I could dominate you guys. I got a whole lot of them here. I just, I'm gonna ask mine while y'all thinking, real quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, and that is, Let's talk about the reality, and I've seen this, the evolution, I've been pastoring a while. I've seen the evolution of not only doctors, but actually psychiatrists and other practicing physicians now want pastors, spiritual guides, spiritual leaders in with their clients, work hand in hand. I get calls constantly, even from hotline centers. So there's been a whole evolution of where, talk about the place of spirituality in that healing even in the medical profession now? Well, one of the things that I, I think people who come see me know, because usually well, when someone is looking for a therapist, the first thing they probably do is check a website. So most people do their homework. They're going to see if you're on Facebook, or they're going to look around for you. But at the least, if, they're, if you're on a directory, they won't look at their directory. And so lots of people didn't even look at the directory, but when you call my phone, the end of it says, have a blessed day. Right there, they already know what, that ain't everybody saying that. So she's probably of some faith. And that's what they said. They said, I know you something. I don't know what. But you have a blessed day. So that gave me a clue that you, you practice something. And then they'll go back through your website and see. And then there's some people who don't have any but are willing and open to embrace the client's spirituality because prayer for the black community for forever. Well, the church was there before therapy was. And so if that means collaborating with their place of faith, their pastor, their leadership, with their permission, of course, then we want to bring as much social support as possible because if they respect that person more than they do the process they do with the therapist, then we want to bring in that person because we now create allies. Because we can't be with that person all the time. And if there's someone that can get them to believe or to follow our recommendation, we want to collaborate with as many people as possible that, again, that have the best interest of the client with their permission. Okay, thank you. That was, uh, that was my question. Anyone else before we, it was a great opportunity, guys, if you have anything you want to close out with because uh, Dr. Clack is going to show her book in a moment. And I need women's ministry to know that we have um, 
because of our commitment to this, we have, um, we're gonna have her book advertised on our website, our Facebook page, and Dr. Clack, this will be recorded, so if you want a copy of this for your files, you can get this whole session uh, that is recorded. Uh, Sister Brown, look like you have a question. That's what I was gonna ask, a question um, concerning her book. It's a chapter in her book that talks about your history is not your destiny, how to um, how to heal and how to trust again. If she could explain to the women, um, you know, how to how to do that, how to get past your history to get to your destiny. So it's a journey. It is one that I find that again, I feel like I'm a guide, really, I'm a witness to a woman's experience, but it really is to shift the narrative from living the person who was injured, hurt, and broken, to believing in healing, restoration of the soul, the spirit, and the mind, the body. I'm a very holistic practitioner. So I, you know, I'll do recommendations, so I need you to work out 30 minutes a day, I want you to change your eating, all the way up to, yes, let's, let's look at scriptures. What are the scriptures you're standing on when it comes to this? All of those things are about helping that person to become whole again. And when people have been hurt and they feel broken there, and much of their experiences have been fragmented and they can't put things together, they live, they continue to live their way and then they allow their trauma to define who they are. And that goes again back to their self-worth. They will still operate in relationships, they'll see themselves as broken. They will mask the, the feelings of shame. That's it. That's the one I want to take for. You know, that's a good question. Underlying that is shame. And for me, shame is one of the most deadliest emotions for me. Because shame and guilt are not the same. Guilt is I feel bad about something I did. Shame is I feel bad about who I am. And therefore, I continue to carry that into my life and in my relationships. And there, that's where history continues to kind of repeat itself, right? And so when you talk about your, your history not being in terms of your future, it is to heal that part of yourself that was hurt and broken so that you no longer define yourself by the things that happened to you. So that, I love that chapter, yeah. That was one of my favorite chapters to write. So guys, um, any other Questions or closing? Yeah, do, do you have your book with you, Dr. Clark? I do. I can hold it up on the screen so I will get everyone to see this. Uh, you got to say something so you'll be the center there. Talk about the book. Oh, so I so I had a couple covers to choose from, and this is the one that stood out to me. The colors were vibrant. I wanted women to see themselves, so that's why her face is so intense. Um, the, the, the back part you can't see as much, but there's another image of a woman in the background. And once you get it, you can see it. But I wanted it to be a book that stood out. I wanted the color to captivate you because I know that the meat and information in here is one that can be a little intense, but if you can get through it and work through it, I promise you on the other side of this, you will be healed. Use this richly as um, a, a workbook as well. There's a couple pages in here that leads you as a couple fill in the blanks, but do your own work. Um, this may be your invitation into the therapy once you get into this. This may be the book that helps those conversations with those family members. And you actually have, I didn't have a conversation with that family member. Um, this may be that book that could open that dialogue because it's so non-threatening. The narratives in here of women who share their story are stories that are just like yours and mine. I just changed dates, ages, places. But there's not a story in here that has not happened to one of us. Okay, this, uh, anyone else? Mika, China, everyone good? All right, so Marcia, anything? You're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. There you go. Okay, I didn't want to cut everybody off. <laughs> I just want to thank you for being so transparent 
in answering the questions that um, we asked of you. And I'm sure this won't be the last time that you will be hearing from Shadow Baptist Church. And I'd like to continue with maybe a couple other sessions, get some more women involved in these discussions. And you're an excellent discussion leader. Thank you, thank you so much. Listen, I mean, I've been in this office in three months. I come in every day now and then. I don't know how these flies got in here, y'all. I just keep wetting them up. And, and we can't see them. <laughs> oh, you can't, because I'm sure you can't. Probably like you going like this. Well, yeah, we, we thought you were having a middle episode here, but we are okay. <laughs> or praising. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I would, I would like to set up something with you. Yes, ma'am. Um, at a future date. Yes, ma'am. And uh, Misha, as part of our young people, you and Nikki can talk about, you know, direction that we want to go and where this has led to. This has given us something to talk about. And all the women on here are the women who work they have the connections in the church. Um, I want you to know as pastor, you and I have talked about this. This is an area I've, I've written, uh, done several PowerPoint sessions for men on mental health, which is a whole other area. But uh, I thank God um, that we are now getting there because I want to close, if no one else has it, can you close talking about the reality of this last wave of protests um, where now I think it was the CDC that said racism is actually an illness. Uh, so can you talk about how this last wave is kind of pushing our mental health uh, as we close tonight? Talk about what do, you, what's, what, what do you think about where we are prophetically from your spiritual part and what's happening mentally to our young people? Yeah, so we're, what we're seeing in terms of uh, the pandemic, so we had the coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, intersecting with the racial trauma. But then there's a third intersection. So I call this the intersectionality of three pandemics happening. The second wave is coming because we're not out of COVID. So that's that's the first one. That That is still a pandemic. The second wave that's here and coming is a mental health pandemic. And the reason why we're saying that is because the numbers of people, I myself, my practice is overflowing. And I have two people who work with me. Lots of clinicians, we can't take any more. We're trying to do our best. Because of the sheltering in, the anxiety, the depression, um, and the stress, just the stress of this. So it's not even that everybody who's struggling has a mental illness. This is a mental health crisis. And on top of that, you have people who are unemployed, um, who didn't have access to resources or don't have access to resources. And then COVID or the corona exposed the inequities and disparities in health and mental health care. So when you look at the numbers of people who are dying from COVID, they're largely black and brown people in areas where there's a lack of access to hospitals who didn't have respirators. Well, I can go on, I'll talk about that all night long. But I want to I wanted to talk about the intersectionality. We have COVID that comes and brings us huge stress, right? brings a lot of grief, and we didn't get to talk about grief tonight, but how many people have lost someone, know someone who um, lost a loved one, or someone who is either recovering from it, or is fearful that they work in a health and they'll contaminate a family. So we didn't even touch. Okay, so that is that mental health pandemic that's coming. Then you have with George Floyd and, and the continuing things around the tail, all of those things that were bubbling already, that has you know, hit the surface, and then you have the mental health. You have three of these in a melting pot, and they're all bubbling at the same time. And now we have to figure out where do we meet the needs of the people. And when it comes to mental health, we're stretched, right? We're already stretched, and we're trying to, to meet the needs of the community. And that means that there are voices out there that are talking about the rape trauma. So we, we hope that we continue to have leaders um, including our faith leaders to be the voice for in the church about how to manage our anger. So many clients that I'm working with are so angry and that is part of their, their mood that they're struggling with. 
So we have all of these things coming all together and at ahead right now, and we are not even at the end of nowhere near at the end of this. So, so I'm saying, say go self-care is going to be important for all of us. And I just wanted to say any last words for anyone? China? Yeah, I wanted to add to the, to the people who are watching to advise them not to be afraid to seek therapy. The best thing is to be able to talk to somebody, put your heels up. They don't know you. They don't know your family and be transparent. And a therapist will help you peel layers. They'll help you discuss issues that you never, that you were afraid to put out into the atmosphere. So what better way to discuss your issues with somebody who don't know you who can't judge you? So let this be a, a, a starting point. You know, maybe the seed is being planted, but I pray that those who are listening really take it and run with it. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Someone else, uh, Misha? I have one more question. Um, with us speaking about how mental health, is there something that you can some signs to look out for or some first steps to take if they notice like, hey, something, something's off for my child, but I don't want them to be scared to talk to me. I don't want them to think I'm going to place them in a residential facility, but I still want them to get the help that they need. Question about what I heard most of, and then something happened. So I think you're, I'm going to summarize it. Um, how to help parents that to do it, to getting mental health for their youth. The parents taking, what are some of the first steps you would recommend for parents to take in regards to helping their child? They may notice there might be some mental health issues or there might be something off without necessarily telling their child, I'm going to place you, you know, in a residential facility or I'm going to take you here or there, but really just getting them the help that they need. Sure. So sometimes I think parents out of frustration and will say things. What you're saying, like if you don't knock it off or behave or whatever words parents use. <laughs> Um, threats of putting them or sending them with a relative or something like that. Um, if they're mature enough, like our teens, we can talk to them, but you have to have a relationship with them. And that's one of the hardest things that a lot of parents have, uh, because we, out of necessity, have to work two jobs, maybe three or four jobs. These kids are home by themselves a whole lot. So the time, by the time we get home from work, Either we're too tired, they're sleepy, they're engaged in social media or on their video game. And so we miss opportunities to connect with our kids to find out how was your day in school? Did anything happen? Did you get this, you know, to really inquire about their life. So guess what? They talk to their peers who definitely don't have the wisdom of a parent or an adult. And sometimes I would use a parent's friend as an ally. I've seen um, a mom and a daughter who don't have a really good relationship but somehow the daughter has a relationship with mom's friend. And the mom kind of be, is the kind of go-between and would help her mother to be a little bit more receptive to her daughter's stress. Because there's been some dynamic between the mom and the daughter that needs to be worked out. And so sometimes you need to bring in a third person. It could be an aunt, it could be a best friend, it could be a, a, a youth pastor. Like It could be someone who has a vested interest in the kid being able or a young person um, being able to talk to the parent about what's really going on. The other thing that I think is happening is that moms and dads are already struggling with their own mental health, and so they don't have the capacity to give their kids what they need in terms of build their mental resiliency, and so they do need someone to get in there and help them as well as their children. All right, so we're going to close tonight with a word of prayer. We can continue to go on and on and on. Uh, there's so many areas we really have not touched. Um, as you are aware, next Monday we have another practitioner on. We're going to be speaking with her, and that will be more general. So I want you to get those questions together. And I'm going to do a series, and I want to tell everyone, I want to echo what China said. Uh, we recommend uh, Dr. Clack, even if she can do referrals. Uh, I heard her say her business is overrunning, which I would expect. But I think, guys, you don't know how many of our people are hurting and suffering in silence because of that stigma of people thinking you're crazy or you're cuckoo or whatever else they want to call it. So tonight I think we accomplished a lot. Those who are listening by Facebook, 
Uh, come tell someone. This is going to be on our Facebook page. Tell them to tune in and get some help and some wisdom and some direction. And again, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. I thank you. Don't forget, you can purchase her book. Um, I'm going to ask that um, you stay in touch with Sister Marcia and Sister Cindy to get that on our blog. Better go to Judy, Judy the Worker. They're, they're the leaders, Judy the Worker. So let's get that on our website. Uh, Marcia, Marcia and Cindy are leaders, and Judy's a, a worker. She does a lot of correspondence. Let's get your books in. We'll set up so we and Judy set up so we can get them ordered in and you know how we get them on our website. And what we'll do is use our PayPal and that kind of thing. So anyway, I'm excited about tonight. Uh, I need you to know that this is what I believe the church should be doing. Um, we are at a place now where people are not getting the socialization, the fellowship, the support they were getting from coming in church, which was keeping their mental illness at bay. So now we got to make sure we reach out to them. So I thank all of you for your time. Dr. Clack, I'm going to close in prayer. And you know we have an open line. If you need to call me, do so. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for everyone listening. Someone may have a daughter or a son or someone may be experiencing some situation and symptoms themselves and they've been trying to pray it away and shout it away when God said wisdom I've given wisdom wisdom is in doctors wisdom is in a multitude of counselors Proverbs said there is help wisdom is when we understand that God is the one who created the knowledge to bring healing so Lord we ask that you will continue to bless uh, Dr. Clack's practice, bless all the her family and all the things that she's doing, Lord. We bind up the enemy who would try to attack her for the valuable information that came out tonight. And Lord, we ask for her peace of mind as she's gone on her journey. I thank God for every one of these wonderful, talented, beautiful women that are working out God's program right here in Shiloh. I thank them, Lord, for they're going to make sure other women get help. The mark of a good leader is to make sure I care about them other people's problems. So tonight, God, we ask you to continue to bless us to do what you called us to do in this hour, unprecedented time of darkness, where we got to let our light shine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Everyone have a great night. God bless you. All right. All right. Good night. And uh, can you make sure you call to, uh, someone's going to call you tomorrow. You and I talked earlier. Someone will call you tomorrow. God bless you. I'm going to end this for everyone. Get your last smile. All right. Here we go on. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. Good night.